Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. I'm Danny, and today, Great.com talks with Nina Smith, the CEO of Good Weave. If you haven't heard of it yet, Good Weave works to stop child labor in global supply chains. This is a very, very important subject. But before we begin, if you're new here, remember to press subscribe on YouTube or your podcast app. Hi, Nina, and welcome. Hi, Danny. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. I want to begin by learning more about your history, about how the organization began. Sure. Well, our founder, Kailash Satyarthi, began the organization um, back in the early 1990s. Then the organization was called Rugmark. And he had been at the time working in India and across South Asia working to um, track down children who had disappeared, helping their parents find them. Um, these were children who had been often kidnapped and trafficked into um, different industries. So maybe into circus, into stone quarries, into um, carpet factories and all kinds of other um, exploitation and um, it was sort of one by one work, very important work. And he also at the time began um, trying to um, create a basis for bringing um, legal action to support those families, um, ultimately trying to reunite them and get the children back into a safe place. But he also learned through that work that there needed to be more than one by one work, that you know, there was a need for some systems change models. And so he had this idea to create a market driven model where consumers in the West might be able to identify and choose products made without child labor. And in so doing, drive a market for, um, for clean business, for clean supply chains, where buyers would require their manufacturers to produce goods without child labor. So that was sort of our founding time. And actually there's on our website at goodweave.org, we do have a video of Kailash, who's um, now a Nobel Peace Prize laureate for his work, um, talking about kind of the founding moment and when he had that aha moment. But the idea was to create a model for how we could address this problem in a single industry. In those days, we were only working in the handmade carpet industry, improve that we could do it and that this could work and this um, success could be replicated into other industries and inspire others to do similar kinds of work. So, um, so yeah, those were like the early inception moments, but a lot has happened since then. That was uh, almost 30 years ago. Oh, I can, I can imagine. And this is actually a really interesting view of what was happening back then and I can only imagine how this has escalated or at least changed in, in the world especially considering if you go to as just a, a hint to our viewers and listeners go to their website it's incredible it's really great and you can fully understand the amount of work that we're talking about here their actions are really really extend and coming back to to the history it makes me think of how much of this context that I don't know. Because as you were speaking, I could never imagine that this was a need even back then. So could you help us understand now what is the situation that you're trying to, to fight against? Yeah, well, back then, um, in the founding days, the International Labor Organization estimated 220 million children uh, working in the global economy. Um, and in the first kind of 20 years um, of my work, I saw that those numbers declining. So every few years, the International Labor Organization puts out new estimates. Um, together with other organizations, and we were down to 152 million. And then in 2021, new figures came out um, showing a rise. And that was 
that was data that was collected and analyzed prior to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So for the first time, we started to see an increase in to 160 million children worldwide uh, caught in exploitation um, in, in domestic work, in global supply chains, in other forms of work. But um, and we know that the pandemic has only seen an increase. We, we have um, UNICEF and the ILO estimate another 8.9 million children that will end up in child labor as a result of the pandemic because of increase, because of wage loss, increased poverty, um, school closures in the most vulnerable communities. So the problem's on the rise um, and yeah. Yeah, I think that, that gives you the, the primary context I think you were looking for. Absolutely. And it helps us to paint a very dark picture if you think about it. Really, uh, I, could, I could not even imagine myself working as a child. It is, it is just completely unfair and, and honestly chaotic. It doesn't, it doesn't really get together in my mind. I, I think it's important to um, remember that a lot of what we're talking about is not doing chores in the household, isn't you know, helping out in the family shop on a weekend day. What's really going on is children are being deprived of their education um, and any other opportunity for themselves. And so they are, um, they are working, not only uh, not going to school, but also being abused. So that might mean they work 18 hours a day. They're sleeping on the factory floor. I've heard stories of children who've been abused by other workers in these settings. Um, it, it, it's not that um, it's it's a light work helping out. We're really talking about true exploitation, to truly robbing individuals of their their right to to live, to live freely. Well, it is it is terrifying, and it's just for me, it's insanely sad. Now moving to to your approach, because there is something, again, that we're gonna highlight on your website uh, when you talk about remission. Uh, we can read that, uh, you read works to stop child labor in global supply chains through a market-based system and holistic approach. And I very much like that idea. Could you explain that a little bit more to us so we can fully understand it? Yeah, so the idea, um... The idea is that we engage companies to agree to have their manufacturers um, be evaluated for their practices to ensure there's no child labor. Oftentimes where we see the worst kinds of child labor happening, it's in what we call the subcontracted supply chain or the hidden supply chain. So a buyer may go to you know, visit their factory in Nepal and that factory looks good, but in fact, orders are subcontracted to other units where the goods are made. And sometimes a majority of an order is made that way. And those, you know, those small factories and sometimes home-based production sites aren't um, managed. There's, there's no standards being upheld in those places, labor rights standards. So that might mean children are working, it might mean proper wages aren't being paid, it might mean adult workers are indebted to their employers and can't leave. Um, and so what we do is we work with the manufacturers to what we call map the supply chain to see where all those nooks and crannies are, go there, our teams on the ground that are local to the communities where we work, um, do random unannounced inspections, which um, serves to both prevent child labor because a manufacturer, a producer never knows when we're going to turn up. Um, and um, it also enables us to identify cases uh, when they exist. So uh, there's really a, a business incentive here because if a manufacturer is found to be using child labor when the buyer has given strict guidance that that's not allowable, you know, they risk losing their business. So that's why we call it market driven. Um, but it's a little more nuanced than that. 
we try to really build the capacity of small to medium um, size enterprises that are in these supply chains that often aren't set up to implement corporate codes of conduct and rules. They're more informal companies. So we work with them hands-on to you know, adjust their practices. Um, at the same time, and part of where the word holistic comes from, we are working in the supply chain, but we are also working in partnership with worker communities. We have programs on the ground um, embedded in the worker communities that uh, are really person to person. We have we do household surveys. We know what's going on in every family, what the learning level of the children is, whether they're in school or not, and then help to strengthen local schools and systems and local governance to ensure that that community um, no longer tolerates child labor, that every child in the community goes to school. Um, and these programs also involve what we call bridge schooling. So, you know, children who are already 12 years old, but at a first grade reading level, are, um, these programs help to ready them to streamline um, into the government schools. So, um, so that's the holistic part. We also uh, implement a range of programs to support parents, you know, workers um, to be able to access healthcare, financial literacy, and the standards that we use to evaluate the supply chains also ensure decent work for adult workers. Well, this is really beautiful and necessary. I keep thinking here of what else is involved when a child is put in this situation. And as I understand it, you're trying to cover fully, right? To give it not just the opportunity to be out of it, to get out of it, but to you know live a full life after that, because it must be quite damaging to the child to be put under this situation. And I keep wondering also, what are the challenges that you're facing when you're trying to build these connections with the community? It, it must not be easy to you know approach not just the, the company, but also the parents, the community that has these this kids in there. So how does that all, all happen? Yeah, well, um, we work with um, an all local team with local NGO partners that are proximate you know, to the areas where we're operating. And the community programs are staffed by individuals from the community. So basically part of the process involves identifying individuals in the community who have, who have been educated, who do have a motivation to work on these issues and they get special training to be able to implement the program. Um, and so they're working neighbor to neighbor really, which really helps um, with the access. It really helps um, our teams understand what are the challenges parents are facing in everyday life. And these kinds of challenges include the schools aren't really functioning well. Um, it includes, well, mom and dad have to work and there's a baby and the you know, 10 year old daughter has to stay home and take care of the baby. Um, these are real life issues that, um, you know, those community facilitators work to help the family address so that the children can go to school. And one of the beautiful outcomes is that oftentimes, um, I should mention also that there are societal norms in some of these communities that are quite conservative where they don't necessarily support girl children over a certain age going to school, for example. But part of the transformation happens when parents see what happens when the kids actually go to school and learn. So it benefits a mom and a dad who are weaving carpets or stitching garments when their kids can help them calculate their wages and compare the wages they were actually paid with the wages they should have been paid. For example, we have loads and loads of anecdotes like these where really the parental um, perception of whether or not a child should stay home and work alongside the parents or go to school completely shifts. Well, it is, it is quite mind blowing, I believe, 
to have this possibility to shift situations in your household. It's just really, really amazing. And looking at this whole situation, another thing that I, I need to ask you, especially again, going back to your website, it's something uh, that you highlight there is that you'd read label. And that leads us to something on the individual level, right? Because we are talking about your big uh, efforts as an organization, but us as consumers as well can do something about it too. So what is this label? Yeah, the, the label is um, is sort of the, the symbol that shows um, that all that work I just described happened before a product hit the store. So in the United States, um, we work we work with um, um, buyers all over the world. I think in 20 countries now where there are importers and retailers that sell products with the Good Weave certification label on them. Those labels are individually numbered and can be traced back to where the product was made. And we can also assure that there's no, um, no falsifying of those labels or anything based on the, those numbers. Um, and yeah, and so, I mean, I think what consumers can do certainly where there are products that carry this label really in carpets and home textiles, basically in home, home goods and home textiles, they can go into a store and ask if they have any products carrying the Good Weave label. They can make a choice between two products, one that may have a label and not have a label, um, to go for the one with the label. So it's sort of a, I mean, I think that that's, I always viewed that as one of the best parts is making it easy for people in the marketplace to do the right thing. Um, and our website does have a searchable list of stores around the world where these products are sold. So um, yeah, that's sort of the, like I said, sort of the label is the face of the organization and the logo is a knot. So it's, it's, it's representative of a carpet knot, but it also looks like a, a human being. So um, it's very distinguishable. And it's beautiful. I gotta say this. I loved it. It, it, it truly is beautiful. And uh, one other thing that I really curious to ask you is if you could share some of the future goals and priorities for Good Weave as an organization in the near future. Yeah, well, um, about eight years ago, we only worked in the handmade carpet industry and we got to a point where I would say we sort of scaled our solution in the industry and in that, you know, um, about a third of the market uh, for globally of handmade rugs carried, you know, carried the label on it, right? So we were certifying about a third of the carpets globally, had a huge impact in reducing child labor. Uh, but we needed to do more, especially because these issues have been much more in the spotlight. The issue of modern slavery, the issue of child labor is of great concern to, you know, individuals like you and me, but governments around the world. And, um, and so we saw an opening to do more, to replicate what we were doing. And we expanded from carpets into home textiles. We're working in the fashion industry now, um, and we're looking at how we can both grow our footprint in those sectors and do more and get more companies engaged and kind of go all the way in these industries. But we also have our sights on both partnering up with other organizations that are, um, that are working on sustainability standards in different industries and really um, share our methodology so they can integrate um, our criteria on how to address child labor and have more impact within their, their own organizational approach. So that's one piece. And also Goodweave itself is looking at how we can set up in new countries and new um, sectors as well. We have a new initiative in Bangladesh in ready-made carpet, uh, sorry, in the ready-made garment industry. And 
we have a big research project that's gotten underway now in partnership with Nottingham University, the Rights Lab at Nottingham University, which is one of the leading um, modern slavery uh, research groups to understand what's really going on on the ground there. Um, as we all know, because of the, in particular, because of the Rana Plaza incident, that factory safety and, and wages are huge issues in the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh. But there's been very little um, research on these broader modern slavery issues and understanding what's happening beyond the factory walls with um, outsourcing to informal workers and prevalence of child labor and other issues. So. So this is really important. And, um, and yeah, we're also starting to look at the artisanal cobalt mining. Um, our, I, I do fear the word artisanal makes it sound gentle and um, high end, but actually the term artisanal is used for really for informal that, that you know, we're not talking about an industrial mine, we're talking about individuals who go out and dig for cobalt because it is in such great demand right now because every lithium ion rechargeable battery requires cobalt to work. And 70% of the world's cobalt is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, there's a need to really address what's happening to children and families in this artisanal part of the sector, because it's 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 quite um, it's probably the most inhumane of all um, sectors that I've personally learned about, seen with my own eyes. Um, it's it's really a matter of life and death when someone goes into one of the artisanal mines. So, uh, and and children are often the ones sent down into the tunnels underground to go extract the cobalt because they're small, but then they may lose a limb, they may lose their lives. So um, this is something that we're talking about working on. There are other organizations also looking into this industry and we feel like we have a particular set of experiences that might enable us to bring um, some of the solutions anyway to the fore. And we're starting to raise funds to work on this issue as well. That's great. And thank you so, so much for sharing all of this with us. It, at least for me, it helps a lot to understand what's coming ahead for all of us. And Nina, that drives me to my very important question today, that is to achieve all of those goals. How can we, not just the people who are listening, but anyone that might get in touch with this episode now, how can we help you keep moving forward with that? Yeah, well, there are two or three things things people can do. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we always need financial resources. So at our website at goodweave.org, people can go click on the donate button and um, donate funds. Um, obviously, shop with your values. If you believe like we do that child labor is wrong and has no business being involved in the products we buy, touch and use every single day, you know, make good choices and look for products with the Goodweave certification label and other um, labels that might, uh, in other industries that might um, have a similar approach. Um, and ask questions when you go into a store. How do you know where these products are from? Where were they made? How do you know it? Um, and those kinds of things as well. And um, I think the other thing people can think about is in many of the countries where your listeners are based, there may be laws on the books that, um, that prevent goods being bought and sold that are made with child labor and modern slavery. In the US, we have a law that bans products made from forced labor um, that is enforced by US customs and they require companies to prove they, their products were not made with forced labor. So, um, you know, talking to your representatives and asking questions about what is our government doing to address these issues. Um, those, are, those are all things that aren't very difficult for, for people who are motivated by this issue to do. 
Well, absolutely. And again, vital work. I think advocacy always goes a long way, right? It helps a whole lot. Nina, thank you so, so very much for talking to us today. It was a great, great talk. Great to meet you, Danny. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And for everybody listening, also, thank you so much. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app, because that shows the algorithms that this is an important conversation and we can spread the word about the importance of good weave. Check the website, donate if you can, but most of all, spread the word. Bye, and I see you at the next episode.